I really want to run at the top role. And I've been met with a lot of challenges in my search. Naturally, it's a very competitive market, a lot of great talent, but a lot of CEOs and founders who are apprehensive to take a chance on a number two. I always say like the chief people officer is kind of like the secret service, the chief of staff and the vice president, like all wrapped into one role. What really matters is when we're in the shit together, I'm not going to go running. I'm not scared of it. I've proven loyalty and you can talk to anybody that I've worked with. Janelle, thank you so much for joining us today. Everyone, Janelle Lopez has joined us for our special segment on reversing roles. We brought Janelle in to interview us on a couple spicy topics on this short segment that are near and dear to my heart. And this is going to be a good one, I think. So Janelle and I worked together at Yahoo when we started in 2007 together back at Yahoo. We were arguably babies at that point. So I have known Janelle for almost 20 years, which is insane. I don't know where that went, but incredible HR leader, had a five-year stint at Yahoo, grew a ton, went over to SurveyMonkey after that, and basically grew into the number two role doing what was, you know, a right-hand person to the chief people officer, and that will probably be her next role at some point. So Nolan and I thought it'd be great to bring Janelle on to ask us some hard questions about getting to that CPO role, getting to that number one role, and what it's like out there. And I know you've been in the paint on this, Janelle, so please yes, hit us with yes. some, 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 hard, some hard questions. Yes, thank you for having me both. I can say I've been, you know, I left Survey Monkey in October, so I've been actively in market having a lot of conversation. So the podcast has been phenomenal for me over the last three months. A lot of the topics really resonate, you know, work trials, how many number of interviews, you know, alignment with the CEO and kind of all the red flags and things to look for. So it's been so refreshing. So I've really enjoyed it. And yes, I've been in market and historically my background leads to a number two, which is you know, exciting for a lot of the roles out there, but I really want to run at the top role. And I've been met with a lot of challenges in my search. Naturally, it's a very competitive market, a lot of great talent, but a lot of CEOs and founders who are apprehensive to take a chance on a number two. So with that in mind, my first question to you both is number one or number two role, like which one is best for what? And how do you both think about those two roles? Um, when a candidate has a wealth of experience, but hasn't actually stepped into that top job. So I always start with, what are you optimizing for? And what I think I heard you say was, I want to be a number one. And if that's where your mind is, that's where you are. And so I would say, go all the way in, do not settle. You've already been a number two. I, one of the things I like to tell my friends is, is about my own career is I've optimized for learning and impact. And when I left DoorDash, I had the opportunity to go be a head of talent again, but I had already done that job. And I knew I wasn't going to learn as much if I went and did that job again. And so my take would be, if you want to be a number one, you will go be a number one and don't settle for anything less. So Janelle and I have talked about this a bunch the past couple months, um, you know, and the worst reason to take a number two job is because you don't think you can get a number one job. Uh, I, I've always told her, like, it's it's like I use this analogy a lot. It's like marriage. Like, it just takes once. Hopefully. Hopefully. It just takes once. And uh, there's three to five years of your life. And a lot of folks take that you know, role that comes right at them and they say yes immediately. And maybe it's not the perfect fit or the right thing. And that's very hard because you don't know what's next or what's out there. So you want to rush things. But I agree with Nolan. Um, those opportunities are out there. And Janelle and I have a good friend we worked with for years. And he always said the the number one job is easier than the number two job. Amen. <laughs> and I totally believe that if you have the right team. Um, so I agree with Nolan that you should definitely keep going on that path. Do you feel having spent, you know, almost 12 years at one place, there is value in me stepping into a number two role in a new organization, maybe, you know, expanded scope, opportunity to learn under a different leader 
um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you could talk yourself into whatever you want to do, like, and, and we could tell you why that's a good idea. But the bigger thing is, is like, what do you want? Because like, if you want to be a number one, I don't think being a number two again is going to help you be a number one faster. Yeah, I, I think, you know, from the founder CEO perspective, I, I, I've been there right? That you've never done this before, et cetera. That's just, a, it's a hard thing to break. And it's frustrating to me because if I look like someone like Janelle, I mean, she she can run circles around a lot of number ones that, that yep. might be in seat right now. And mm -hmm. it's just, I just wish people would get past the number two piece because you, you kind of have been doing number one work at SurveyMonkey for years. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's a, I think that's a stigma out there. Nolan and the industry that you have to have been a number one before. I get it in some experiences and some things out there, but as far as just you haven't done it before, I think that that is misguided and it's a weird bias. It's um, a, and, it and, is. And, and candidly, like I, I don't understand it. And it makes me, it makes me wonder about uh, who you're talking to. It makes me wonder about how you're pitching yourself, because as Kelly said, which I completely agree with, the number two role is significantly harder than the number one role. And the mm -hmm. number one role, it's kind of just like, you know, you're kind of like the face of the thing. And so you have to communicate the thing. And so you do have to be able to communicate well. But yeah. as it relates to like the actual nuts and bolts of how things are working, I mean, you know, for me, that was like, I trusted my team to do that work and would be there to help them. But I wasn't actually doing that work. And in a world to where Kelly, you and I have talked about this on the pod a bunch, where we're moving away from manager only. To yeah. You got to be able to manage and totally. you have to be able to do in a constrained yeah. capital world. Yeah. <laughs> this is the type of person yeah. that you want to hire. So Janelle, I'd ask you is like, you know, what types of companies are you talking to? Are you indexing more later stage? Hmm. Um, are you talking to earlier stage companies? Like, how have you thought about the spectrum of what you are open to as it relates to stage and size? Yeah. Yeah. I naturally have gravitated to more early stage, probably like series A, B, C, you know, or something in the yeah. employee population size, typically below 100. I think we, anywhere between 200 and 750 is a, a sweet spot, more so because for me, I liked the build at SurveyMonkey. I joined when we were 100 employees. So being able to come in early enough to help influence, help shape things, build something together um, is where I feel I could add a lot of value. I think that part of my stage at SurveyMonkey is really fun. Um, so I think, you know, I'm not opposed to later stage companies. Again, I just know and continue to hear, especially in a, you know, public company over a thousand employees, there's an apprehension. So with that in mind, a question for you both, you're talking to CEOs, you're talking to founders, you're advising all the time. What advice are you giving to them and guidance when they bring this topic to you? You know, I really want somebody who's done the job, this market, this economy, you know, and they're hell bent on that. You know, what is your guidance to them? knowing you've seen the work that a number one and a number two, and you've both been in that seat before. Yeah. Well, it's so funny you brought that up because, uh, you know, you know that I've referred you to like s five folks at this point. And I'm like, yeah, I need to talk to this person, like forget everyone else. But I do have a hypothesis that there, there, there are biases out there to Nolan, your point, mm -hmm. because founder CEOs don't understand this role fully. And so when you don't understand something, yeah. I mean, we talk about it in DEI. We talk about it. When you don't understand something, it's, it's, not, it's unknown to you. You generalize, right? And I think people have hooked on to, I need someone who's done it before because they don't really know what it is, right? To the point of who are you talking to? And another bias, and I, I, I had it, Janelle, when I left Yahoo to be a number one, it took me a long time because the other bias was you've only been in big companies. You can't do this. Uh, and so when I talk to founder CEOs, I'm like, listen, stop generalizing based on someone's background or even pedigree or number of years in a company. Get into who this person is and what the hell they've done. Because, you, you, again, I think you've been doing number one work for years. 
And someone will look at your resume and be like, ah, she's never done it because they're fearful or, or it's unknown in some capacity. So I've been trying to demystify that, um, whether it's with founder CEOs or VCs, because I think we have to break that to unlock an amazing talent pool out there that's arguably very needed in this seat going forward. Well, this comes up in every exec role. And, you know, typically the conversation I'll have with CEOs is, what are you hiring for? we will say, chief people officer in this case. I'll say, great. What are you optimizing for? I'm like, ah, you know, I really want someone who's done it before. And then I'll say, why? And then it'll kind of just be like silence or they're like saying a lot of words, but actually like not saying anything important. And then my next question is, is, well, what do you want the person to do? And I think this is where the meat of the conversation is, Janelle. And I think this is where when it comes to the what and the how, like if me and you were interviewing against each other, I think you would kick my ass for companies that are less than a thousand people. If you pitch yourself correctly, because you are doing hands-on work way more than I was doing in my prior role. I was doing a lot more managing. I was doing a, doing a lot more company com communication. And as it relates to managing and company communication, generally that's a learned skill mm -hmm. and it's, you know, you're mm -hmm. a great communicator. I think you already have this skill coming in, but when it comes to the nuts and bolts of how people operations need to work inside of a company, I'm going to have to hire a head of total rewards. I'm going to have to hire a VP of HR. Like that's not going to be the work that I want to do. And that's the work that you've been doing. And mm -hmm. so I think your pitch and your story needs to orient on, I'm actually going to do this work and I'm going to do this work until I break. And that's when we're going to hire somebody else underneath me. And I think that's the story that would really resonate with series A through C founders in this moment. Super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, while at one company for a really long time, the amount of change transformation that happened in those 12 years, most people don't even experience in five different roles, you know, anything from build, culture building, hyper growth stages, M&A on both the buy side, sell side, transformation, you know, yeah. it's just, yeah, your aperture is huge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have to take the time to really be able to articulate all that because exactly. it's like dog years, right? Like you might not even remember half the shit that happened <laughs> eight years ago. And before you go out there and talk to these founder CEOs who you can anticipate are going to have this pushback, it's almost like journaling, right? What, what, mm -hmm. let me, let me pull out all these pieces in this experience that connect to this because you have them in spades. Now, the other side of that, like no one disagree or agree, but, but double digit years at a company, I would look at it. I'd say, oh, what's, what's going on mm -hmm. there? In your case, the story is freaking, again, number one role for years. In other cases, that is not the case. And so I will say I am a proponent. I've talked to people, you know, and in my own teams at times, I'm like, you got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, right. look at my career, it's like you build, you go. So you have to have a point of view on why you stay and yeah. also why you go, right? Um, well, I, I would frame it slightly differently, Kelly. I would say like, you need to have stories around what you did. And then you need to also have stories around what the naysayers will say about your resume and your background. Mm -hmm. And it's super clear for you, right? You have two major stories that you have to speak against. Number one, you've only been a number two. Why haven't you been a number one? Yeah. And the second thing is, you know, you were at SurveyMonkey for 11 years. Like, and, and, you know, this is what the hiring manager is thinking. Were you just resting and investing? Like, why don't you go jump somewhere else after a few years? And if, I, and, you know, in my mind, on the second point, it's an easy story, which is like, I was constantly learning. Um, I was continuing to take on more responsibility. Mm -hmm. I was making a huge impact. I love my team and I'm loyal. And so mm -hmm. what that means for you when you're hiring me, who, you know, really, I always say like the chief people officer is kind of like the secret service, the chief of staff and the vice president, like all wrapped into one role. What really matters is when we're in the shit together, I'm not going to go running. I'm not scared of it. I've proven loyalty and you can talk to anybody that I've worked with. 
as it relates to the, the number two and not yet being a number one, I think that's a really easy story too, which is most number ones, when they become a number one for the first time, don't have anywhere near the experience that I have. And so I just wanted to wait until I was fully ready. And now you're getting me at peak, peak moment versus having to train me on the job. Because candidly, right. me, Nolan, I personally learned on the job. And you're going to come in with way more experience than I had. And it's really like easy that. to get that, in, uh, you know, you tell us, but it's easy after a while of being told you haven't done it, you haven't done it to almost feel like you shouldn't do it, right? Or you can't do it. It's totally. almost like, I mean, I've been. That imposter syndrome freaking gets in there and you're like, oh my God, like, how do I get out of that? Because it's not the right narrative. And so going back to all those things that you're thinking through that you've done, that no one said, wherever you got to do, jump in jacks, like, like, you you know, it's very easy to lose sight of that um, in a process. And we should just be honest about that. Like, we're all human. I felt it when I was trying to jump from Mm -hmm. Yahoo to number one, and it can be very frustrating. Yeah, I've almost spun my narrative a little bit to lean into what I've heard, the feedback I've heard today, because I've yeah. I've been turned down quite a bit, you know, in this journey. Yeah. And I'm now confident enough to say, look, this is what I'm hearing. This is how I think about that and bringing that head on so that if they had any questions about that, that it could become a dialogue and a conversation. Totally. You should lead with it. Um, yeah. And, and I, I take these things head on like that's my strategy on all of this. The other thing which was really interesting about you and the moment that we're in right now is that you currently have time on your hands. Yeah, and Kelly and I have talked about this a bunch on the show, but interviewing is bullshit. We don't learn anything from interviews. It's an entirely performative experience. And so I think one of the things you should lean into is, look, I have time right now. We could talk to each other. Like We should definitely have a bunch of conversations to make sure that there's at least some you know, kindling and semblance of fit here, but let's just get to work together and you'll actually get to see my work product and I'll get to figure out where your skeletons are buried. And then, you know, let's pull out in two to three weeks and see if this is a fit for, for both sides. Yeah. I personally think like you are in the most advantageous position, given that you currently do not have work right now. And not only for them to be able to test you, not only for you, for them to get over the biases that we've talked about. Yes. Also mm-hmm. for you to get into the weeds to make sure that this is actually a place where you want to be a chief people officer. Yeah. And yeah. you it's want great. to own all the shit that is associated yeah. with that job. Yeah. And and she and I just talked about this. And I said, listen, do, do not interview somewhere and take a job. Like, hang out with them. Um, spend time with them. Right. Th- this is This is your choice more than it is their choice um and and really and really take that time um yeah but i think you're doing all the right things i guess do you use the open to work badge on linkedin janelle is that should we oh, no one oh should god. no god just kidding never mind never mind <laughs> I don't, uh, but when i left survey monkey i made it very clear that i was in market for my next opportunity and i'm grateful yes. for the network that i have and i think I've just been really proactive in connections and meeting people, reconnecting. And I think that is where I've found the most success in just putting myself out there and connecting with strangers, people who have referred me, VC partners. Um, It's been great. Love it. Well, we are obviously a part of that network. You are a phenomenal HR leader, one of the best I've worked with and seen. And thank you. I know this has helped a ton of folks. And um, Thank you for having me. HR Heretics is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Econ 102, Moment of Zen, and Turpentine VC. Subscribe, five stars, share it on Apple, YouTube, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts, all the things.